today on the Film Alliance. While the camera world was focused on the Sony FX30 APS-C cinema camera, only a few have mentioned or spoken of the Fuji X-H2. The APS-C X-H2 can record internally in ProRes up to 8K 30 frames per second with a 40 megapixel sensor and has seven stops of in-body stabilization. Today we're going to compare the Fujifilm X-H2 to the Sony FX30 and see which one is right for you. While I'm telling you about the X-H2, the undertone will be, is this camera better than the Sony FX30? In this video, we're going to focus on real-world usability of both cameras, image quality and specs, and photography that you're going to get with both of these cameras. And that's that's what we're going to cover today, like it or not, here on the Film Alliance. The X-H2 is the Fujifilm camera that video creators have been waiting for. It's also the perfect hybrid camera as the 40.2 megapixel sensor is more than enough when someone is doing both video and photography. With a price point of $19.99 for the X-H2 and $17.98 for the FX30, one must contemplate which is better and why. I've owned the FX30 for a while now, and I've shot all types of things with it, such as client work and cinematic footage. I've thrown a couple of excellent lenses on it, even built it into a rig. But I also use the Fuji X-H2 in different video setups, such as an interview talking headshot, B-roll, and some action shots. The X-H2 was released after its older brother, the X-H2S, which has the same body design and is more expensive. Still, the X-H2S can shoot in 6.2K open gate, can shoot in 4K 120, and has a stack sensor which improves speed performance and has less rolling shutter. So in theory, the better of the two Fuji cameras is the X-H2S if that's what you use it for. Anyway, I digress. The FX30, however, can shoot in 120. It has a 1.64 times crop and it doesn't crop in until you press record. I can't tell you how frustrating this is when you're all set up, all right, go. And you've got the frame that you want and then you press record and the whole image punches in 1.64 times and then you have to reframe everything. The X-H2 does not shoot in 4K 120 but it does have a stack sensor. And the X-Trans CMOS sensor, which is how Fujifilm reduced the price, allows it to shoot in 8K 30 frames per second. Just because it can shoot in 8K 30 frames per second doesn't mean you should. Is your editing machine powerful enough to edit that footage? I can tell you that my 64 gigabytes of RAM iMac is insufficient to edit without creating proxies. However, for the X-H2, if you want to shoot in 4K and use the full 8K resolution, you can digitally zoom in two times to get an even closer look without losing that 4K quality. This is great for those of you who like to shoot nature photography and birds of prey. With that said, it all comes down to image quality and usability in my opinion. Do you already own lenses? If so, for what mounts? I have a ton of E-mount lenses, so if I wanted to invest in a Fuji camera, I would also have to purchase lenses that fit Fujifilm X-mount, which is a whole nother investment. It's for that reason that someone like me, who owns a bunch of Sony lenses, is probably gonna stay in the Sony ecosystem. But Sony tends to lean more towards that digital image, whereas Fuji has more of that film and cinematic look, which tempts me to jump over to Fuji. As I was recording with the Fuji, I was in awe of how the colors were coming out. The X-H2 has F-Log, which is similar to Sony's S-Log. Fuji's color profiles are better than Sony's preset colors because they look more realistic. I shot a ton in the profile called Eterna using the X-H2, and I barely had to do any post-production work on the color grade. I was happy with how it was all coming out, whereas with Sony, I have to do maybe not a ton, but some color grading to ensure all of my clips match up right. Do either of these cameras overheat? Well, not when I was using them, but I have to tell you that the FX30 does come with an internal fan, whereas the X-H2 has a fan attachment that you have to buy separately. So if you would like to shoot those long interview shots in a hot room, I would go with the FX30. Regarding photography, the Fuji does come on top because it has pixel shifting technology that can take the 40 megapixels out of the sensor and change it to 160 megapixels in fact, this feature will take 20 raw photos and then combine them using Fujifilm's Pixel Shift Combiner software. That's a mouthful. So imagine that for a second. Photographers can catch 15 frames per second in full resolution using the mechanical shutter. The FX30 only has an electronic shutter, which will produce more of that rolling shutter effect. I didn't experience too much difference when it came to battery life, although I can tell you that the X-H2 has 10% more battery life than the X-H2S. 
On longer shoots, I would go ahead and build out a rig and use a DTAP battery because this will give you a full day of shooting without having to stop and change out batteries. Speaking about stopping and changing out your batteries, have you ever stopped and tried to create 3D videos with your edits? I wanna thank today's sponsor, which is Wondershare, who's offering a new software called Anna 3D. Adopting the most cutting edge technology, Anna 3D has launched two creative features, split depth 3D and VR 3D video. After you sign up, you download the 3D converter with the affiliate link in the description. And if you use that link and make a purchase, I'll make a small commission on that, so thank you. Once it's downloaded and on your desktop, you can import your video clips and adjust the ratio to match the ratio of your video. You can adjust the endpoints of the video to trim it up and then export your video. And it exports in a quick amount of time. Watching 3D videos without 3D glasses is no longer impossible. And a 3D can convert 2D portrait videos into glasses-free, 3D videos. The way it works is it constructs the foreground, middle ground, and background with straight lines to create a parallax effect. With Anna 3D, you can enjoy 3D videos with one click. I'll leave a link in the description, and now let's get back to our video. Memory is a big deal to me, and although both cameras have dual SD card slots, I did have to purchase a CF Express Type B for the X-H2 to be able to record those larger files, which is limiting because I would have to buy a whole new ecosystem of memory cards if I wanted to pick up the Fujifilm camera, but because I already own Sony cameras that use CF Express Type A cards, then I don't need to invest in more memory. Now think about this for a second. If you use the CF Express Type B cards in the Fujifilm X-H2, then how are you gonna transfer that data onto your computer? Unless you buy a CF Express Type B card reader. You can use the USB port on the side of the camera to transfer your images, but that's annoying, especially when you have to transfer a lot of big files. I noticed that the autofocus in the X-H2 did not live up to that of Sony, especially when recording human faces. The FX30 has 495 autofocus points, and the X-H2 has 425, and I did see a lot of focus pumping and breathing as I was trying to shoot different subject matter with the X-H2. So if you're more into autofocus, then the FX30 would be your camera. Both cameras have a mic port and headphone port, and a display that is fully articulating and touchscreen, which is a must, especially if you wanna make YouTube videos or you have a rig and you wanna put the display on the outside of your rig so you can see your camera settings. I did have some quirky things happen with both cameras. Maybe that's just user error. But with the X-H2, the whole offloading the data was a holdup for me due to the workflow I'm used to. So because I have to buy new memory cards, new lenses, and a card reader for the CF Express Type B, I don't think I'm going to invest in the Fujifilm camera. Also editing in 8K was pretty difficult, as I mentioned before, because I didn't have the proper editing rig. That's not Fuji's fault, that's just the fact that cameras are advancing in technology faster than our computers are. So I had to make proxies, which was another holdup for me when I was editing in 8K. The first night I had the camera, I couldn't figure out how to record, and after about an hour, I finally realized that the lens was not on the camera correctly, even though the lens was seated on the camera. I've only had that happen once or twice with my Sony cameras, and that's how I knew to look for that when I was dealing with that issue. But the fact that it happened on the first use made me wonder if I just got a bad apple. Also, another quirky thing that happened while I was editing was I had a few files that turned black after about five seconds. I saw the actual image and then five seconds later, it was all black and I tried everything that I could to figure out why that was and it didn't happen to every clip, it was only a few of them. So it made me think that the camera was recording corrupt files onto my SD card. It wasn't a game changer for me, but it would have been a crucial mistake had I been recording a client interview. As for the FX30, it's definitely not a beginner's camera. I'm literally still learning it, and I can tell you right now that I honestly don't know how to switch between auto and manual exposure. Now this might be a good thing because it forces me to nail exposure every time, but it's a bad thing because if I'm in a run and gun situation and I wanna switch it over to auto exposure, I'd really have no idea how to turn it on. And I've done a little research, but not enough to figure it out. So if you know how to switch on auto exposure on the FX3, please let me know in the comments. But it's stuff like that that makes me realize that both of these cameras are great and they're gonna help you tell your story, but they're also kind of complicated to use as well. I will say the longer that you own a camera and use it, the more you'll become accustomed to it. Like I know how to use the A7S III and play it like a flute because I've had it for a long time. And when it comes to image quality, I'm gonna give it to the Fujifilm camera mainly because I was getting that look that made it look like an actual movie. So if money wasn't an issue, then I would invest in the Fujifilm ecosystem mainly because of that image quality. Am I explaining that correctly? Do you understand what I'm saying? If you do, let me know in the comments and help me better explain that. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. I'm Joe with the Film Alliance, and please let me know in the comments which one you like better. Until the next video, have a nice week.
We're gonna have to wait for that blender to get done. <laughs> You'll hear it. Thank you to Lens Rentals for sending over the Fuji X-H2 so I could compare it to the Sony FX30 for you. Today on the Film Alliance. While the camera world was, let's do that today on the Film Alliance. Today we're gonna compare the Fuji Film X-H2. Today we're gonna compare this, today we're gonna compare the Fuji Film X-H2 to the Sony FX30 and photography and photography features and photography and photography and photography that you're gonna get with both of these cameras. And that's what we're gonna cover today, like it or not, here on the Film Alliance. Mm -hmm.